Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 479. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And today's January 24th, 2019. Okay, welcome to another show. George and I are here to tell you the news, the Anglican news. But before we do, I want to get to my show notes to, to make sure I'm doing the right things. Yes, I am audience participation time you've heard this before actually there's a lot of new people to the show there's something else i have to do because my e here's my email how do you say your name how do you spell your name well it's it's up there now i'm kevin Carlson. this is george conger when gavin comes the up two I'll put, l's all these years i've been spelling it wrong oh that's all right don't worry about it yeah nobody it's everywhere i go because i'm from the midwest it's calson it's colson it's not Coulson like it's supposed to be. It's it's the most mispronounced name in, in history, except for Smythe. Yeah. Well, how much longer will you call me Conjure? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, names are hard, apparently, in this world. So like the show, of course. Uh, share the show with your friends. Comment on it. We had another great uh, commenting session with our last show. You do that in YouTube. Subscribe to the show. Subscribers, we're almost up to 4,000 subscribers. We're looking for a million. We're, we're getting there. And we have a podcast if you want to listen to the podcast. Let me take these uh, egregious names off the screen and take us back to Unscripted. Uh, George, it's been a wonderful time, but you had a little surgery this week. Yes, I had a vein taken out in my uh, left leg from ankle to groin. The uh, uh, I'm going to get both both sides done, but they because I had surgery on my right foot two weeks ago. They did my left leg Wednesday, and about two three weeks I'll do my right leg. Because of the sepsis, the vein kept expanding, contracting, expanding, contracting, and finally, it uh, wasn't popping. It was uh, elasticity, yeah. Whatever it was, so that all the so that the blood would pool, uh, the expansion and contraction, as you said, it lost elasticity, and so they, uh, I, it, it, basically, what they do for varicose veins, but it was internal. Uh, so, uh, uh, so. I, well, good, you survived. I, I, I survived. It hurts, it hurts, but there's nothing to look at to say that's where it hurts. It just hurts. <laughs> it's on the inside. Yeah, well, it's it's a miracle of modern medicine. You know, uh, almost 25 years ago, they, they didn't have a treatment for the loss of elasticity in your veins. And, uh, you know, that would have led to uh, cardiomyopathy. And, uh, you know, you had two or three years to go. But uh, thanks to advances in medicine you're you're going to do just fine george because we need you on the program because the anglican communion is going absolutely crazy they need anglican unscripted they need you and i to sit down every uh, couple days and talk about the next chaos in the communion that's what should, this is the episode called chaos in the communion that's what we're going to call it self-inflicted self-inflicted <laughs> yes it is uh <clears throat> suicide by archbishop yeah we we know how it works let's talk about some follow-up uh our story last week was obviously uh nigeria uh and cana and the appointment of four bishops supposedly not going to be pushed into acta but maybe pushed into acta uh um, but uh, nigeria said here's four cana bishops uh for you do with what you want with them is there any follow-up to that story? Yes. Uh, several layers of follow-up. There was a spontaneous eruption of discord from Cana clergy about one of the candidates. Putting aside the issue of how they were appointed, one of the candidates is an advocate of the prosperity gospel and of the word of faith movement, and that I have the word of the Lord tells me X, Y, Z. And, Kenneth Hagen, if you want to uh, go yes. back to the 80s, yes. Uh, and this is not Christian. Uh, and so there was a clergy uproar, and Felix Orgy, who's Bishop of the Diocese of the West of Cana, put out a wonderful theological statement on the heresy of the prosperity gospel. So basically, Bishop Felix handled this just perfectly. He did not name names. He did not say, this man is a nut because of X, Y, Z. Rather, he laid out the fallacy of the teaching, why it is not in conformity with the gospel. It was a teaching document worth reading independent of the particular issue. 
And now what it does, it hands the ball back to the Church of Nigeria, because at this point, the only person who could undo what has been done is Nicholas Oko, the primate. And basically, Foley Beach can say, well, do you really need four? Can we get by with three <laughs> new bishops? And so, rather, so basically, Bishop Felix has allowed this to be finessed in such a way as to allow Kate, uh, the Diocese of the Trinity, which is the diocese that has the, the new suffragettes. Yeah, he, uh, he's the victim in all this. To, that, that'll continue, and it'll continue to prosper, but at the same time, of, uh, Bishop Felix is let, set, setting down the fairly well accepted markers of the Christian faith and saying this particular teaching, which, oh, by the way, is held by one of the nominees, is out of bounds. Yeah. Well, let's back up a little. We, we talking about Bishop Archbishop Foley's options. As the new leader of GAFCON, I think it's a great chance for him to stretch and find out exactly how much leadership he's being afforded by the other GAFCON primates. I would hope that he would have uh, called up or Skyped Nicholas Sokol and said, no, you know, that would be my hope. Uh, you know, we're not doing this, we're not doing border crossing, um, but I don't know what the conversations are. I haven't talked to Archbishop Foley uh, about this topic yet. Maybe we should uh, uh, get his opinion on here in a, in a month or two. As... One of the things we get, didn't get to talk about in the last couple of weeks is the follow-up to the Acne College of Bishops. They met down in Florida. They had a great time, took some pictures on the shore. They also had a meeting, and at that meeting they talked about uh, the prayer book, and now we have a new prayer book, George. Well, we're farther along the process. Uh, we had the various approvals. It's got to be printed and this and that. Sure, but yeah. it, it's now the response to prayer book revision, whatever sort of prayer book revision you have, is going to be exactly the same no matter what. When Thomas <laughs> Cramner came out, he had probably had the same grief that actually. Liturgy had. fairies are out there. <laughs> the liturgy fairies are out there. <laughs> And we're going to have arguments about the placement of commas, about this is a wholesale abandonment of the Christian doctrine as received in the 1979 Book of Common Prayer, that. That was which so of bad. course came <laughs> by night, which of course was a total of the uh, previous 20s book. Well, there are some people who are complaining that's too Anglo-Catholic. There's some people saying it's too charismatic. There's some people saying it's too evangelical. Um, well, but here's what's not happening. I don't see anybody having a service where they spray salt around the, the prayer book. I think people are willing to work no, with that's it. that's the book of occasional services. <laughs> that's right. That's the exorcism, <laughs> right. They'll do that. No, the, I, think we should congr I think we should congratulate uh, the ACNA people for several things. Mm -hmm. uh, the merits of the actual book of common prayer, I'm not a liturgist. Uh, I like style. I like language. And it seems fine to me. I mean, it cannot compare with the majesty of, say, the Cramnerian prayer book, just as the King James Version of the Bible uh, can't, is better literature mm -hmm. than some of the, most of the, all of the contemporaries. Uh, contemporaries. Sure. Now, but literature is not the same thing as uh, utility. So I'm not going to speak to its merits, but the transparency in which this was done, there are no secrets. There's no surprises. Nobody can wake up and say, hey, I never knew. Well, the tr the, the congenitally ignorant are going to wake up tomorrow and say, I never knew. Mm -hmm. But this was done transparently. It was done collaboratively. Um, ACNA, ACNA is doing what they said they would do, which I'm surprised because most churches don't do what they say they're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> they laid out the perimeter parameters, and they kept to it, and they kept to the timeline, and they kept to... Uh, good job, folks. Well, let's talk about something they're having trouble doing. And uh, since day one, ACNA has said we're going to work out and have a final solution one day on holy orders. Uh, and for those who don't know what that means, women clergy in the church. What, what is their place in the church? And uh, they've been fighting this out and fighting this out. They've, they had a, a secret conclave meeting in Vancouver, and they didn't hash it out. And it's still, so, I don't think they're to the point now they're just kicking the ball down the road. They're just trying to find a solution. And uh, there may Kevin, not be. I, I'll, I'll disagree with you. Go, go ahead. You're allowed to. They have found a solution. Okay. 
It's what they're doing. That's right. And the solution is and to keep talking every, about it. Every bishop's meeting, we will see reactions saying, we'll see expectation in some quarters forehead. Now they're finally going to settle the women's orders issue, meaning they're going to get rid of them. Mm-hmm. And we see a flurry of articles, academic, scholarly, political, Holy order fairies on the internet, yes. <laughs> coming out. And it's all well-intentioned, uh, some better quality than others. Mm-hmm. But we see this. And then they have the meeting. And then there is sort of a deflation because they've not done anything. Well, that's the decision ACNA has made. They're not going to do anything. There is that portion of the dual integrity, as they call it, I think. There's that portion that accepts and affirms the orders of women in the priesthood and diaconate. And then there's that portion that does not accept the orders of women in the priesthood. And, and the there's the, a lot of middle ground. There's there, what they discovered in Vancouver is the middle ground. All those who, the majority, would not uh, uh, bring a, a female into holy orders. However, they wouldn't prevent other people from doing it. That's what they discovered. So, <clears throat> so, but I think. I hate to say this to people who have their hopes set that ACNA is going to be pure one way or the other, but ACNA has decided. And I don't see this decision being undone in the lifetime of the current leadership. It's just the way it is. And I can't disagree. And um, I am happy with and most you know, ACNA people, ninety, I would say good 99% are happy that they're talking about it happy with the growth of the church, happy with the new prayer book, extremely happy with the leadership and their and, and the relationships and, internationally with GAFCON. And what Kevin and I uh, are, I'll speak for you, Kevin, on this point. What Kevin and I are doing, we're not addressing the merits of the issue. No. We're not talking about whether women's orders, where we come down on this. In fact, we, we sort of avoid talking we about that. say a word. What we're talking about is the process mm-hmm. and the politics and, if you will, the sociology of it all. And ACNA is an American church, is a Canadian church, and it is reflective of the culture and in some respects. And the culture in, uh, say, Southeast Asia or Africa that would stand in the way of women's orders, just purely from a cultural perspective, is not present. Nor is it the culture of East Africa, where women's orders arose out of the enthusiasm of the East African revival, where you know Rwanda, Uganda, Kenya, the the, the church is almost universal. Well, what's wrong with women priests? I mean, it's it's part of their cultural understanding of how they receive Christianity and the gospel. These are sociological issues, not theological. And we're not going to see them resolved in our lifetime, I believe. No, you and I have a problem. And the problem is not our opinion on it. The problem is dual integrities. It just, in a visual sort of way, it's not working. You know, in, in my humble opinion. I want to talk quickly. Because, well, but, and and uh, the other problem with dual integrities, and when I mention this to ACNA people, they get livid, absolutely livid. They get ballistic. Well, for those who are opposed to the ordination of women, and Gavin is a prime person, this mm-hmm. is a salvation issue. This is, you know, upends the whole iconography, understanding of what happens at the Eucharist, what the pre- the role of the priest is. This sure. is not purely, oh, I don't like girls. No. This is has deep theological understanding of what the universal church has always said and done and believed on this point. If we can have dual integrities for an issue of that controversy, then why can't the Episcopal Church have dual integrities on marriage? Now, people say, oh, that's not possibly possible to be. Obviously. Well, <laughs> well and politically, you're right, it's not working. <laughs> no. But where do you stop having dual integrities on issues that are not universally accepted to second order? Mm, Ordination of women, mm. uh, what is marriage, uh, the sacraments. Now, may... You know, if you remember about 15 years ago, 10 years ago, Sydney was really pushing lay celebration of the Eucharist. That you don't need priests to celebrate Holy Communion. <coughs> Excuse me. That is something, that's a ditch that a lot of people want to, would die in. What happens when that arises and catches fire and you have 
a group within the Anglican and within the within the Gathcon world go down that road? Can we have dual integrities there? So the what I'm talking about is not the issue per se. No, not but the, the idea of dual integrities. Yeah, uh, it, we we got it, folks, and yeah. uh, well, it's it, not pretty. The unity is not there yet to have dual integrities. Let's move on to the Anglican Unity Task Force. Now, this is what they put out in their statement. It says, We recognize that the reality of overlapping dioceses rooted in our different histories has no immediate resolution, but must not prevent us from moving forward in our mission. I think it does have a solution, George. Um, now, if people don't understand, in the ACNA, you have uh, affinity diocese, you have some geographical diocese, you have uh, the Carolinas, where you have six overlapping dioceses, basically six bishops represent different portions of the Carolinas. It's kind of crazy. I think there is a solution. The solution says, in, at your next meeting, do this, say, in 10 years, we're going to have no more affinity diocese and we'll work it out in the next 10 years. You have to set a deadline. You can't just have these meetings uh, saying, we understand it's a problem. If you understand it's a problem, you need to work towards a solution. And the best way, in my business sense, is to set a deadline and work toward that. Well, uh, again, I'm not gonna be particularly holy on this issue, but you need to have the underlining structural things in place. Mm -hmm. well, <coughs> once you have a universal pension plan, for instance, or universal health insurance, that people are bought into and are committed to, where you have an identity that's greater than the local uh, union that you're tied to, then you can begin those moves towards ordinate, uh, uh, towards uh, unity. Mm -hmm. But you know, with the Carolinas, we have six dioceses uh, for historical, racial, so on and so on and so on reasons. Um, it's too soon for each of those to give up their unique identity and heritage. But at, with the passage of time, and when you tie people more tightly together with the second order things, pension, pay, health, conditions of employment, being able to move from one jurisdiction to the other as if you're moving within your own diocese, these things will sort of fall, fall off on their own. But you just but again, Kevin, you're right. You need a timeline, but you need to have the structures in place to allow that timeline to have a chance to succeed. Well, I think in my concern, it, when I see affinity diocese, you know, does Cana have as much skin in the game as maybe Florida or uh, Texas? Because Cana, if they don't like it, they're strong enough just to to pull out and move on. Well, you know, ACNA's not what, doing what we want, and we don't need to be affiliated with them. We can move on. Um, you know, Amia tried that and you know, destroyed them. But you know, I want everybody to have equal skin the, in the game. Well, and, and, I think the difference between Amia and Cana is the difference between Martin Mins and Chuck Murphy. Oh, ah, absolutely, sure. Martin Mins did not create a personality cult. Amia under Chuck Murphy was the, a personality cult. It, it was more than that, of course. Yeah, it was but much more than that. Yeah. Much more than that. But without Chuck Murphy, there was no Amia. Martin Minns, you could not say that. Martin Minns, his... You can tell the success of a regime by it's how it changes leaders. Martin Minns' departure from the leadership of Cana with the rise of Felix Orgy and Julian Dobbs and the continued success of that organization speaks to Martin's leadership skills in not creating a cult of personality. Now, Martin is perfectly capable of, was perfectly capable of recreating Amia with he in the Chuck Murphy role, but he chose not to go that route. He didn't make a kingdom. Now, within Canada, there's some kingdom makers, but I don't think Martin, uh, uh, was one of those in the beginning so but we're not here to complain about Cana. we're not here to complain about other structures it's just you know i'm the type of person who says everybody should pay some taxes because <coughs> you need to have skin in the game in america 49 percent of the citizens don't pay any taxes and so they just don't care and uh, i want everybody in the acna to have that same skin in the game. They all have something to lose and something to gain from the success of uh, the ACNA or failure. <clears throat> George, let me go back to my show notes now that I've completely moved all the way over here. 
Did you know two weeks ago that there was an Anglican in the White House and his name was not Trump? That's right. Yeah. Uh-huh. What's Donald. The story? Oh well, <laughs> the Anglican angle for this is that a an ACNA priest, Matt Hensley, was one of five new Americans naturalized at a ceremony at the White House by Donald Trump. Now, whatever you may think of Donald Trump as a person, his political skills are the best. There's nobody better. <laughs> you had Matt Hen- Hens- Hensley or Hel- uh, I want to say Leona Helmsley. <laughs> I don't know. That's that another real estate magnate. But, but Matt Hensley, I think it is. That's correct. I think. From England. Uh-huh. And then you have a, a man from Bolivia, a man from Jamaica, a Chinese woman, and an Arab woman. I like this, to teach this the This is a Coca-Cola commercial. I really I mean perfect harmony. Do, 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 do. Yeah. Small businessman, an <laughs> Anglican clergyman, a professor. Oh man, if you wanted if Donald Trump wanted to paint sort of a, Nor- uh, a Norman Rockwell portrait of America, uh, what we want in our immigrants, he just did it. It was a beautiful PR uh, it's a moving, important, vital ceremony in the life of any new citizen, but I think the president's doing it in the Oval Office was a political uh, PR coup. It was a master, you know. Now a lot of people saying, "So we only do five a year?" Yeah, you know, you, you, you know, there, there, there's, there's theatrics and there's theatrics, and you know, um, I would have loved to be naturalized in the the White House. You were so, born. In, you were born in Minnesota. How? Why would you not then? Minnesota is a different country. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> oh man. Let's talk quick international news. People remember uh, towards the end of Christmas the Asia BB story. Um, wonderful Christian in Pakistan offered water. Is the story or, or something to a Muslim woman? Uh, you can't do something like that. And she was uh, basically brought up in charges and they wanted to kill her. And uh, uh, it's still working through the courts. Um, nobody knows ex- her exact whereabouts. She's disappeared. And I want to contrast that with Rahel. Rahef, I can't even pronounce her name. The young Saudi national. Yeah. Rahef El Kunim. Kunan, uh, who fled Saudi Arabia uh, and her parents, who were very mean, and uh, she gave up. And uh, what what happens when you leave Islam? You apostate. 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 She was apostate from Islam. Asia Bibi could not find a place to go. Canada would not take her. Europe would not take her. Australia would not take her. America, of all places, would not take her. And I think it's because... We don't know what... <coughs> Yes or no? Yeah. I don't think the I don't think the request was ever made in the United States. We don't know that, um, but we do know uh, because the Canadian government, the British government, the Australian government, the Italians, the French, several governments have spoken out saying yes. And I've I can't remember the approach to the United States. Yeah, I, I I'd have to look that up. So, but basically, there's no home for Asia. However, Rahaf. And I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Uh, had a place to go in Canada, uh, basically within three days of declaring her independence from Saudi Arabia. Well, this was a case of an 18-year-old girl, westernized Saudi, who I believe was going to be compelled to get married, or mm-hmm. she had a brutal family, or she had renounced Islam and was in fear of her life. She uh, managed to make her, you know, fled in the Bangkok airport requested asylum, and then she took to the social media. And she was able to build an international following very quickly of support such that uh, here's an educated, English-speaking, upper-middle-class Saudi secularist. And, of course, the Canadians love that. And I think class is the big point here, George. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, A Christian peasant uh, from Pakistan... uh, doesn't have the uh, uh, how should I put it? She's not as attractive uh, to the uh, to the yeah, yes. to the media and to the world as yeah. is a uh, as is an upper class woman. That's and it. It, now good for this young girl who was able to escape a, a terrible fate. 
um, because you know we read about these uh, women who have tried to escape from arranged marriages, and we read about honor killings. Her her future was not bright. So Absolutely good for her that she was yeah. smart enough and clever enough to use the system and get social media to leverage her escape. But I think it also. Uh, I hate to sound like Kami Pinko, but you know the rich do have a better time in this life, mm -hmm. and and you know peasants uh, are still treated like peasants. No, it, it's it's a tragedy. Keep Asia in your prayers. She one is of the sick, one of the things Gavin has mentioned. What's that? One of the things Gavin's mentioned many times is that the British government has refused to give asylum to any Christian fleeing from Syria. Yeah. They've only given them to Muslims. They've refused entry and up to a third of the refugees are Christian. It's not as if the uh, there are no Christians to be offered asylum, and it's not as if the Christians aren't the professional middle classes of Syria, which they are, but rather the British government has taken an avowedly anti-Christian attitude towards refugees. I don't know if you and I will report on it, but certainly our kids' uh, generation will be reporting on uh, the uh, first sharia law institution into the uk as a form of government uh in other parts of europe i don't you know certainly not sweden and norway uh but you know i can't see france not standing up too long either we'll see something to talk about in the future george you're traveling today so we need to close the program down here i'm kevin Carlson, and i'm george conger and you've been watching episode 479 of anglican unscripted.